morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of our speakers, chairs, and the wonderful audiences of ACNS webinars worldwide. Welcome back to yet another edition of very educative lectures for you. The speaker for the first session of today's webinar is our special guest from Korea, Professor <coughs> Shen Seng Kim. Professor Kim is the director of the Department of Neurosurgery at the Nanuri Hospital, Gagnam, South Korea. He was the past president of the Korean Research Society of Endoscopic Spine Surgery, and he is currently a faculty of the Korean Minimal Invasive Spine Surgery Society. He is a pioneer in the endoscopic spine surgeries as well as a noted author and member of the editorial board of several high ranked journals. He is a member of the board of director of the World Spinal Column Society. He has received several awards and honors, including the Parvis Cambin Award in 2018 and Lamy Award in 2019. We are extremely honored to have him today at the webinars and today we will be talking about his favorite topic, which is evolution of spinal endoscopy. The speaker for the second session of today's webinar is our honored guest from Germany, Professor Hisham Bassioni. Professor Bassioni is Associate Professor of Neurosurgery and he is the Director of two neurosurgical clinics at two major academic hospitals, Clinical Hamburg and Klinikum Wieden in Bavaria, Germany. He is also the member of the German Neurosurgical Society, European Neurosurgical Society and German Skull Base Society. His neurosurgical and scientific subspecializations include neuro-oncology, neurovascular surgery, skull-based surgery, and neuropediatric surgery. He is the first author of several publications in high-ranked neurosurgery journals. And we are extremely honored to have him today at our webinars. And today we'll be talking about microsurgical management of anterior cranial force and meningiomas. The chair for the first session of today's webinar is our honored guest from India, Professor Malcolm Pestonji. Professor Pestonji is a consultant in orthopedics at the Golden Park Hospital, Vasai, Maharashtra, India, and he is also an honorary professor of the endoscopic spine surgery at the Bareilly International University and Rohil Khand Medical College Hospital, as well as honorary endoscopic spine surgeon at the Holy Spirit Hospital, Mahakali, and Dehri East Mumbai. He specializes in endoscopic procedures of the spine, and he is a renowned faculty at various conferences and workshops in the country. We are extremely thankful to him for accepting our invitation to chair the session of Professor Hyun Sen Kim. The chair for the second session of today's webinar is our honored guest from India, Professor Ishwar HV. Professor Ishwar is the professor and head of Department of Neurosurgery at the Sri Chitra Tirunal Institute of Medical Science and Technology, Kerala, India. His clinical practices are focused upon surgery of the brain and spine tumors, vascular diseases, and intraventricular endoscopy. He also runs a pain clinic along with anesthesia counterparts attending to non-cancerous patients. And he has won several accolades for his meritorious contributions to neurosurgery, including the Best Doctor Award in 2012. He has also received a special award from the Chief Minister of Kerala for his contributions to facilitating organ donation from brain dead donors in the state. He is also a noted author with several publications in various period journals. We are extremely grateful to him for accepting our invitation to chair the session of Professor Bassioni. On behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President Professor Yoko Kaito, I would like to welcome both the speakers and chairs to this online platform of ACNS webinars. A very warm welcome to our colleagues in China and we are extremely thankful to Professor Shubin for broadcasting this webinar on the WeChat channel. Dr. Liu Boon Singh from Malaysia is my co-host for today. And with that introduction, I would like to hand over this online podium to our first chair, Professor Malcolm Pestonji. I would like to say, I would like to start by saying a big thank you to Professor Yaku Pato, to you, Dr. Raja Kuti, and to Dr. Boon Singh Liu for having me here with you all. A big thank you to my other co-chair and to my other hosts. And I do not need to introduce to you Professor Yun Sung Kim. He is the big man. He is perhaps the biggest person in spine endoscopy today known in the world. Uh, I and have had the association of working with him, seeing him operate with me in Mumbai way back in 2017, 2018. And uh, I now invite Professor Yun Sung Kim to start his talk. Professor Kim, please start your talk, sir. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Malcolm Pestonj. And I will firstly share my slide. Thank you so much, Professor Yoko Kato and Professor Zubin. Good afternoon, pleasure to be able to give a talk at the ACNS webinar. Today, my lecture topic is uh, the uh, evolution of the full endoscopic spine surgery. The advances in medicine have led to a rapid increase in the aging population. This rapid increase in the aging population has changed the, uh, the pattern of spinal disorders in need of treatment and a, a sharp increase in spinal disorders. Surgical treatment for spinal disease started with open surgery, developed into microscopic spinal surgery, 
and recently developed into endoscopic spinal surgery. Endoscopic spinal surgery has also been steadily developing. It started with the transpyramidal endoscopic lumbar disectomy in the early 21st century, uh, passed through the era of intraminal lumbar disectomy and endoscopic uh, decompression surgery, and is now undergoing the era of endoscopic fusion surgery. In other words, the generation of endoscopic spinal surgery can be divided into the era of endoscopic disectomy generation and endoscopic decompression with or without fusion surgery generation. For the development of endoscopic spinal surgery, the development of endoscopic instrument was essential. In addition to uh, the endoscope of uh, the existing small diameter working channel, a larger uh, diameter working channel has been developed to facilitate decompression and fusion. Advances in radio frequency ablation system for soft tissue manipulation and endoscope drill systems for hard tissue manipulation were entailed. As a result, according to my paper, more than 90% of degenerative spinal disease can be treated with endoscopic spinal surgery. Now, let's look at the full endoscopic disectomy generation of transfrominal endoscopic lumbar disectomy and intraminal endoscopic lumbar disectomy. The rationale of transfrominal endoscopic lumbar disectomy is to promote no normal return to life by completely preserving the functional segment while effectively solving the uh, target pathology as shown in this case of full endoscopic transfrominal lumbar disectomy. Transfrominal endoscopic lumbar approach began after introduced the Cambens triangle. The actual visualized transformer endoscopic approach began when Dr. Young introduced the ES system in the early 21st century. At the then, when Dr. Hugelander introduced the outside in approach in 2005, uh, the transformer op uh, endoscopic approach was able to extend its reach to the extra discal area. And now, using a mobile outside in approach introduced by me, almost all lumbar disc pathology can be solved through a full endoscopic transformer approach. This case of a highly inferior migrated disc. The transfrominal approach was not easy before, but now it is easily solved through various approaches including the supra-pedicular circumferential, circumferential opening technique introduced by me. In particular, in record HMP, which is not easy for revision open surgery, the transformer endoscopic approach is a good way to effectively resolve uh, the symptomatic uh, pathology while almost completely preserving the functional segment. According to a recent study by me, even in impending in neurology uh, such as these cases, the transpyramidal endoscopic approach can minimize neural traction, thus minimizing nerve damage and effectively resolving the regions. Therefore, 
According to uh, the recently published report by me, it can be seen that uh, the transformer approach using the mobile outside in technique ca can effectively access all four corners in the spinal canal. Almost all lumbar disc pathology can be solved through the development of the transformer approach, but L5S1 with high iliac crest is still not easy to do transformer approach. To this end, an intraminal approach was developed, but in the early days, it was not uh, attracted much attention because it was similar to open surgery. However, as a structural preservation interim approach became possible through uh, the annular sealing technique and the ligament problem splitting technique introduced by me, interim endoscopic lumbar disectomy has established itself as a treatment of L5S1 disc pathology. This case is L5S1 foraminal to superior migrated HMP, and this uh, region can be effectively resolved through a uh, contralateral intraminal endoscopic lumbar disectomy. This case is L5S1 broad based central HMP complaining of bilateral radicular pain which can also be effectively resolved through a ventral dural intraminal lumbar disectomy. In the cases of recurrent HMP of L5S1, the lesion can be effectively res resolved through intraminal lumbar disectomy. In conclusion of endoscopic lumbar disectomy, according to a report by in my paper published in 2018 in pain position, full endoscopic spinal surgery can now be applied to all lumbar disc pathology, and uh, more than 95% good to excellent result can be obtained. Now let's look. Uh, at full endoscopic decompression and fusion. While endoscopic uh, spinal surgery has uh, received a lot of attention, the ability to perform endoscopic decompression and fusion played a big role. Compared to tubular decompression, full endoscopic decompression has uh, three advantages of uh, first, mobile angled approach, second, deep viewing of the operation field, and the third, clear view under the fluid irrigation. In 2017, I introduced a full endoscopic bilateral decompression for spinal stenosis to world neurosurgery. And it can be said that the actual lumbar endoscopic uh, neurotral approach bilateral decompression of over the top approach began. In addition, when I introduced uh, the contralateral approach for foraminal stenosis using uh, endoscopic uh, approach uh, to world neurosurgery in 2017, intraminal contralateral endoscopic lumbar foraminotomy was initiated. This case shows uh, severe spinal stenosis before and after full endoscopic decompression. The rationale of full endoscopic lumbar decompression is not simply a minimized op option surgery, but it can be said that uh, there is a rationale in obtaining sufficient neural decompression while completely preserving the functional segment.
This slide shows uh, the process of lumbar endoscopic unilateral laminotomy and bilateral decompression. Let me briefly look at some cases. This first case is an 80-year-old female patient with a severe spinal stenosis. Through the full endoscopic decompression, spinal stenosis can be effectively resolved. This patient is a 76-year-old male patient who needed full-level decompression, and it can be seen that the lesion was effectively resolved with lumbar endoscopic unilateral laminotomy, bilateral decompression, through only two uh, small skin incisions. Long-term follow-up results of lumbar endoscopy unilateral laminotomy bilateral decompression for spinal stenosis also shows good clinical and radiological results. In the paper of a remodeling pattern of a spinal canal after full endoscopic lumbar decompression, published by me. The long-time follow-up result of full endoscopic decompression for spinal stenosis also show good uh, clinical results. This slide shows uh, the process of intraminal contralateral endoscopic lumbar foraminotomy. According to a recent study by me, published in Old in Surgery, Intraminal contralateral endoscopic lumbar foraminotomy can help minimize dorsal root ganglion injury in the foraminal pathology. This patient is a 71-year-old female patient who needs a sufficient uh, lateral recess foraminal and extra foraminal decompression, and all of this region were effectively resolved through only one skin uh, intraminal contralateral endoscopic lumbar foraminotomy, and it was found that the three-year follow-up was well maintained without recurrence of a symptom. Can endoscopic decompression can also be applied to thoracic and cervical, according to the paper of full endoscopic thoracic decompression for thoracic OLF published by me in Operative Neurosurgery. Thoracic endoscopic decompression in carefully selected cases was a safe clinically and radiologically efficacious approaches in the treatment of a thoracic OLF. This case is a 78-year-old male patient whose thoracic pathology was effectively resolved through full endoscopic thoracic decompression and discectomy. This patient is a 31-year-old male patient complaining of uh, middle thoracic pain and uh, light leg pain. The lesion was sufficiently effectively resolved through thoracic full endoscopic unilateral laminotomy, 
arterial decompression, and the patient problem completely recovered after surgery, and it preserved well after one year follow-up images. Can you see the video? According to uh, the paper reported by me in the European Spine Journal uh, at this year, it can be seen that uh, the two-year follow-up of a posterior endoscopic cervical foraminotomy for cervical radiculopathy also shows a good clinical result. In addition, I introduced a safer and more extensive decompression method using partial pediculotomy and partial vertebrotomy in the 2020 World Neurosurgery. This patient is a 29-year-old female patient complaining of shoulder drop and severe cervical radicular pain. The lesion was effectively resolved through posterior endoscopic cervical foraminotomy. And the patient shoulder drop completely recovered in only three months. Finally, let's look at full endoscopic transfibrinal lumbar interval fusion. This figure shows the process of unipotal full endoscopic posterolateral transfibrinal lumbar interval fusion. The first step of unipotal full endoscopic posterolateral transforaminal lumbar interval fusion is the process of resection of inferior articular process. And this process can be divided into medial to lateral approach and lateral to medial approach. This video shows the process of removing inferior articular process from unipotal full endoscopic view. Now uh, remove the infrared crop process in the video. This video shows the process of removing superior crop process from unipotal full endoscope view. The drilling point of superior crop process should be the upper margin of the pedicle as a guide. Chronic adhesive disc drilling which can be performed in endoscopic view is very effective for uh, focal segmental correction and uh, discrete restoration. Endoplate denudation procedure is one of the uh, greatest advantages of full endoscopic lumen interval fusion and uh, plays a very important role in the high fusion process. Now you see the denudation of the end plate under the endoscope view. 
This is very important process of uh, endoscopic An important process in uh, for endoscopic rheumatoid fusion is the uh, safe delivery of the uh, KG into its destination, which is effectively using a Harrison KG glider capable of bilateral uh, root protection. This glider was uh, devised by me. This video shows the process of inserting the KG through the Harrison KG glider. After inserting the Harrison KG glider, the bilateral root protected by the glider. The currently because implemented the endoscopic transpraminal rheumatoid fusion is divided into transpraminal uh, Kambins approach and the postlateral approach. Among them, the transcambin approach has the advantages of performing local anesthesia and ERAS, but the postlateral approach has more advantages when considering various surgical aspects. According to my paper published in uh, Brain Sciences, full endoscopic rheumatoid fusion has the advantage of uh, effect on focal segmental correction because it can sufficiently release uh, the chronic adhesive disc in endoscope view. According to another of my paper published in Brain Sciences, sufficient uh, Adhesive disc drilling on the full endoscope view is also very effective for discite restoration. Recently, a large angled 3D printed KG used for full endoscopic rheumatoid fusion have been marketed. This is believed to be helpful in the development of full endoscopic rheumatoid fusion. In addition, a 2-KG insertion technique was introduced, which is believed to be helpful in the fusion process. Now, let's take a look at the uh, surgical procedures. This case is a 70-year-old male patient with a severe this collapse is the high high grade spondylolisthesis. You can see the preoperative this collapse near completely and the spondylolisthesis near grade more than two. And you can see firstly docking the working channel to the uh, medial border of the facet joint and firstly find the isthmus. Now you can see the some finding of the isthmus. Then uh, checking the lateral border of the facet to find the uh, lateral uh, shape of the uh, facet, then find the uh, lateral border of the inferior articular process tip of the cranial part, uh, then uh, resection to the medial side, uh, then resect to the inferior articular process more easily. You can see here the resection of the inferior articular process and remove the uh, IAP under the endoscope view. After leaving the uh, intraarticular process, you can uh, check the superarticular process. Uh, superarticular process resection also, I, I already mentioned that. Uh, so follow the superior border of the pedicle, uh, then you can easily uh, resection of the superarticular process. Uh, uh, then uh, opening the uh, transformer space more widely. You can see here there's some resection of the superarticular process. Uh, by the, the uh, cranial tip of the supra uh, uh, pedic uh, low water body pedicle. You can see here the uh, uh, supraarticular process. After removing the uh, the supraarticular process, you can uh, directly docking the working channel to the transpraminal space. Then, after firstly, in spite of the fairly uh, severe collapse, the uh, discus uh, space cases uh, after docking the working channel, then after then drilling the disc space, you can see the some 
uh, more widening, widening, widening of the disk space. And finally, you can see the more wider uh, disk space, meaning that the disk height uh, uh, sufficiently restored during the endoscopic process, especially the uh, chronic adhesive disk drilling. You can see here. Firstly, very narrow disk space, but uh, near final state, you can see the more wide uh, uh, disk space. It means that the uh, uh, severe collapse disk already uh, uh, relaxed and uh, uh, restored sufficiently from the initial state of the uh, state. Then you can see the uh, sufficiently widening of the disk space, then insert KG through the Harrison cage glider that uh, protected by rotary number two. After then, you can see the checking the uh, cage so safely uh, delivered the cage and the safely protected the nerve. After then, you can insert the protein screen and finalize the operation. After the operation, you can see the uh, this kind of resource efficiently. Yes, and so the several screen. advantages compared to the existing surgery of a full endoscopic transforaminal metabolic fusion. The first is the, that uh, disc height restoration are very effective. This is also very effective for focal segmental correction. You can see the focal segmental correction very, very nicely. This is very important to the degenerative corrective surgery. According to my paper published in uh, INAT, post-serolateral endoscope transformer mental fusion can be found to be a great help in the reduction of spondyl restasis. Therefore, the reduction of spondylolisthesis can be effectively implemented. In addition, it has a higher fusion rate and process compared to the existing open transforaminal lumbar fusion. This year, I published the result of full endoscopic lumbar interbody fusion in Global Spine Journal. Uh, the end plate denudation technique performed in full endoscopic fusion is a very important in the part of the fusion process. With these proce procedures, I reported the result of fusion, fusion speed and the fusion rate of endoscope fusion more higher compared to with the uh, open transforaminal lumbar fusion. This patient was a 62-year-old male patient who com complained of severe light to lower extremity pain. The fusion was very successfully at only one year follow-up. One year follow-up image. According to my paper published in World in Neurosurgery, because of advantages of focal segmental correction and discite restoration, some of adult degenerative scoliosis can be effectively corrected through uh, several advantages of postural infotile full endoscopic lumbar interval fusion. Because of advantages of focal segmental correction and discite restoration of endoscopic uh, lumbar interval fusion, some of adult degenerative scoliosis can be effectively corrected through several advantages of postural unipotal for endoscopic transforaminal lumbar interval fusion. This patient was a 67-year-old female patient who complained of a severe both low extremity pain. The degenerative scoliosis was very successfully corrected, corrected using a infotel full endoscopic transforaminal lumbar interval fusion. Also, alignment correction can be performed much more effectively as, as shown in these cases.
This 48-year female patient came to the hospital with a very, very severe pain caused by inflammatory discogenic back pain. Uh, in the preoperative X-ray, we can see the loss of lordosis. The patient pain improved remarkably after infantile full endoscopic transformal lumentable fusion, and the loss of lordosis can be seen uh, to be Im remarkably improved. Please check the online, uh, online alignment in these images. Two-year follow. In conclusion, endoscopic spine surgery has uh, been steadily developed over the year. It is being applied in all areas of degenerative spinal disease. In order to develop and popularize uh, endoscopic spine surgery, we must always worry about uh, first successful surgery, second safe surgery, and third research and development. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Uh, thank you so much. Firstly, I give, gave the some answer to Dr. Harshad uh, Parek. Is it possible? Yes, of course. Yeah. Dr. Harshad uh, Parek, Parek uh, uh, asked about uh, what is the advantage of endoscopic fluoral decompression versus microscopic surgery part uh, from small incision, you know, what uh, instance of nerve root injury, uh, how you uh, treat the dural chair. Actually, uh, my uh, answer is that uh, uh, in the, uh, we already well known that the from the pathology, uh, it, uh, it seems like uh, some easy, but unfortunately during the so long time uh, scientific report and the study, the from the pathology is most difficult uh, point of the uh, to solving their problem because of the so that patient that point is uh, successful rate is so low and some recurrent uh, recurrence rate is so high due to the some uh, 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 it related to not only standards but also there is some uh, say tar balance uh, like uh, some wedging because of that uh, uh, so long time it is a very very serious uh, uh, que uh, question in the uh, and the uh, challenge of the uh, spinal uh, treatment, uh, spinal surgery and treatment area. But uh, fortunately, with the development of the endoscopic spine surgery, we can uh, uh, compare to the previous operation, uh, endoscopic e e approach has a two uh, main advantage. One is uh, some uh, preserve the uh, facet joint more sufficiently, sufficiently and in meaning that uh, well, less damage the uh, unstable state of the foramenal path point that is first. Second thing is that uh, more clear view, we can decompress the uh, pathologic point more correctly and more sufficiently with, with the, uh, less damage of the around the structures. And the, uh, so many another advantage, but I think that my, that is a, a two point is more more important point in the uh, why we doing the endoscopic spine surgery and and uh, also the uh, instance of nerve root or dural chair. We, we uh, endoscopic spine surgeon like me, we already published so many uh, some paper like uh, some dural chair instance and dural chair uh, treating technique like uh, some. Uh, uh, patchy blocking, patchy uh, blocking technique like uh, some. Can you hear? Yes, yes. Uh, yeah. And, and and nowadays the uh, nerve damage is not so higher, uh, less, and the dural tear also some similar to open surgery, and it can easily treat it under the endoscope view. It's a sufficient uh, answer. So excellent, excellent, sir. We can hear Have you any question? Yes, <laughs> Liu Bun Seng can ask. Yeah, uh, thank, thanks, uh, thanks, Professor uh, uh, Kim, uh, for a very nice and uh, comprehensive lecture. Professor, I just want to ask uh, with the evolution of uh, ability to do endoscopic fusion, do you find that now uh, the number of fusion that you perform are uh, higher? And do you think that those uh, patients that you previously do not perform uh, 
now you consider opening it from? Uh, in my cases, you ask about to me? Yeah. Actually, recently I'm not doing the open surgery, uh, meaning that uh, they're all uh, patients who need a rumor interval fusion performing under the endoscopically, meaning that uh, two level, three level also possible. And uh, uh, yesterday I'm doing the three level uh, cases of uh, rumor interval fusion with uh, some degenerative scoliosis. I will post uh, tomorrow or next tomorrow <laughs> on the Facebook. Anyway, uh, and uh, after developing the endoscopic uh, spine surgery, especially with uh, some, uh, including the lumbar interval fusion, nowadays my open surgery may be less than 5% in all uh, spine spinal surgery, including the cervical and thorax and lumbar. Uh, so, uh, so a few cases of open. Right, thank you. May I ask, Professor, you, how, how is the learning curve for endoscopy? How long? And where do you start <laughs> with? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Because of that, yeah. I'm doing the endoscopic spine surgery more than 20 years. But uh, actually, the important, um, it, it's like that the important endoscopic spine surgery more uh, higher learning curve. And but nowadays, uh, the bipartite endoscopic spine surgery is in the field. Actually, the Truly, the bipartite endoscopic spine surgery more less learning curve because it easily applied that. But we knowing that our final goal is important because of that. That is, we uh, as a surgeon, as not only as a surgeon, as a doctor and as a mother or father of the patient, we should always give the final destination to the patient, not doctor. Because of that, I believe that in the future. Unipotent endoscopic spine surgery will be the main, but nowadays you need uh, some uh, overcome the learning curve and uh, some developing the technique that uh, in that way it need uh, some together developing the unipotent and bipotent spine surgery. You right. have summed it up very wonderfully, sir. Very wonderfully summed up. If I may just take two minutes to wind up on your talk, sir. Evolution of endoscopic spine surgery you, Dr. Kim, started your journey with Dr. Anthony Young, um, and we are proud that you have been a primary force in this evolution of endoscopic spine surgery in the world. The aging demographics, which you mentioned, is very important because, as we are also seeing now, the amount of incidence of stenosis and fusion surgeries is going up. Your... Uh, basic concept was that the transforaminal surgery started with an inside out, developed into an outside in approach with Hoogland and later on transformed into a floating technique, which was actually brought by you, especially the circumferential pediculotomy, which was a very great innovation by you, sir. So we are very grateful in the world of endoscopy to you for that. We also understand that subsequently we enlarged our... Um, scope of endoscopic spine surgery. It started from the L5-S1 disc and when then came the birth of the interlaminar technique, which you again developed into the contralateral technique for decompression in stenosis. So yes, sir, your contribution in the world of stenosis decompression cannot be looked down upon. It's something great. And we are very appreciative of that. Uh, the other advantages that you brought in was of uh, contralateral uh, endoscopic foraminotomy by uh, over the top technique, your application of endoscopic spine surgery in cervical and thoracic approaches, which you showed us, especially in thoracic OLF was a fantastic innovation. So we are very grateful to you, sir. Your paper on remodeling of stenosis is an eye opener to the world of endoscopy. And I believe that many of us, we follow you day in and day out, sir. Your contribution in cervical spine to partial pediculectomy way back in 2010 was a path-breaking news for us and we all follow it even today and it helps us in difficult cervical discs. Your evolution and bringing about fusion into the plate of an endoscopic spine surgeon was I think one of the last and major and most grateful contributions the world of endoscopy has to appreciate from you, sir. 
your Harrison Grage rider is something that if all endoscopic <laughs> mind surgeons want from you. <laughs> And you are bringing in the two cage technique, the subsidence and fusion evaluation paper of yours was again a fantastic uh, rebuttal to the world. Because when we also matured into endoscopic spine surgery and its fusions, uh, people used to always ask us this question, are your fusion rates comparable? Is MIST leaf a better option? Today I can, on the basis of what you have written and on the basis of your own studies, including that of focal scoliosis correction, I can proudly say, that yes, we endoscopic spine surgeons have greatly benefited from your contribution, sir. Thank you very much for your talk. Dr. Kuti, hand over to you, sir. Well, thank you thank very you, much. It was such a wonderful uh, talk, and we were just in awe of the techniques and evolution of spinal endoscopy brought in step by step by Professor Hyun Seng Kim. We are extremely grateful to both the chair and speakers for coming here and spending that time with us teaching us about spinal endoscopy. A sincere thanks to Professor Shubin for broadcasting this webinar on the WeChat channel. And as of now, we have around 450 people who have joined us on all three combined platforms. Thank you very much. Now it's time to move on to the second session and I'll give the mic to Professor Ishwar who will say a short introduction and invite you for your lecture. Professor Ishwar, all your Thank time. you. Thank you, Dr. Hisham Basione. I hope I got your name pronounced properly. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, you know, in the, there is an expression in English called as the nick of time. I think you have made it in the nick of time. Um, you know, Professor Hisham Basione is an associate professor at uh, two hospitals at St. Marian Clinicum Amberg, Munich, and uh, Klinikum Weiden in Germany. Uh, he wears many hats as he dabbles in micro neurosurgery neuronavigation, intraoperative fluorescence, intraoperative monitoring, neuroendoscopy, etc. He has had uh, splendid publications. Uh, you know, he is the most apt man to speak on meningiomas today because he has published on almost every um, uh, meningioma. Locate, uh, all the locations have been covered in his publications. Um, I understand that he's a member of the German Neurosurgical Society as well as the European Neurosurgical Society. Uh, he's also a member of the Skullway Surgery Society of Germany. Uh, I welcome Professor Hisham Basioni to speak on micro neurosurgery, microsurgery for anterior cranial fossa skull based meningiomas. Over to you, Dr. Basioni. Thank you very much for your kind introduction and to introduce your words. Yes, thank you very much uh, for your kind invitation uh, and uh, um, it's a great pleasure for me to, to join you in this. Um, yeah. A long tradition webinar series and um, my topic today is microsurgery of the anterior skull base uh, meningioma and it's a personal perspective um, so I give you my personal experience uh, and perspective. Uh, generally meningiomas constitute the most uh, frequent primary brain tumor up to 25 percent and even more in the literature and uh, skull-based meningiomas um, comprise around 20 to 30 percent, around one third uh, of all endocranial meningiomas. And it depends, of course, on your um, on the cases you are treating in your hospital. Uh, the incidence of skull-based meningiomas is around um, uh, two per hundred thousand population per year. And uh, most of these uh, meningiomas are located in the anterior and in the uh, middle cranial fossa, and the least are in the posterior cranial fossa. So from uh, the distribution, um, our topic today, the refractory groove meningiomas, or more extended, the, um, uh, the planum sphenoidal or anterior cranial fossa meningiomas, they constitute uh, the second most, only behind um, uh, sphenoid ring meningiomas um, of all um, skull-based meningiomas. So it's a frequent pro problem we are facing in neurosurgery. Uh, what is the treatment goal? And this, um, uh, of course, applies to all, uh, to neuro-oncology in general, but uh, also, of course, to skull-based meningiomas that you are you want to achieve a complete resection. And uh, in case of the skull-based meningiomas, this includes also um, resection of the involved dura, the bone, defined by the Simpson grade one, 
resection. Um, and you want to achieve this during the first surgery because this gives you the, the best opportunity to, um, to remove the complete tumor because of the preserved uh, arachnoid membranes dissection uh, planes. Uh, and of course, you want to preserve uh, um, the function. Um, you don't want to uh, produce a new neurological deficit and you want to preserve the uh, complete life quality and uh, of course, uh, trying even to ameliorate it. Um, ionizing radiation uh, in case of meningiomas are the environmental factor which is most strongly associated with meningiomas. This uh, applies to de novo. Uh, meningiomas as well as uh, malignant progression of meningiomas and there have been several publications on this topic. So we would like to avoid also radiation at least in grade ones and I would also include grade twos. Uh, grade three is another topic. Of course, uh, these uh, tumors are irradiated after surgery. And uh, I have to give credit to my skull base uh, mentor, Professor Samuel Mifti, who always stresses these uh, above points. Um, and I think they are true and they are very important. Historically, the, the first resection of an olfactory groove meningiomas has been performed by the Italian uh, surgeon and also politician, Francesco Durante in 1885, who, by the way, was also the first to perform an intracranial uh, um, uh, surgery in Roma, in Italy. And this was in a 35-year-old uh, woman who uh, survived uh, the, the, um, the surgery um, for more than uh, 12 years. This is another um, um, historical picture from a German pioneer, Fedor Krause. He was the, um, uh, yeah, the father of uh, German neurosurgery, and he wrote a famous book that was also translated into many languages in 1908. And you can see that the most common approach uh, to the anterior cranial fossa was a unilateral subfrontal um, approach. And you can also see that in these uh, times, uh, usually the bone flap was attached to the, um, to the, um, to the soft tissue. So what are the, um, the surgical anatomy and what are the structures which we want to preserve during this surgery? First, the nervous structures. These are the frontal lobes, uh, the olfactory nerves, bulb um, and uh, tracts. And of course, most, most, uh, more posteriorly, the uh, optic nerve and uh, shias. Regard to the vascular structures, this is the anterior uh, cerebral um, complex, the anterior communicating artery, and particularly in the anterior cerebral artery, the A1 and uh, A2 uh, parts of uh, this artery. And of course, the ophthalmic artery, which is underneath the optic nerve. We are usually not performing um, angiography or conventional or DSA in these uh, tumors, but uh, you can see nicely that these tumors are supplied from the anterior skull base via the anterior and posterior etmoidal arteries, which are branches of the ophthalmic artery. Um, of course, being branches of the ophthalmic arteries, it's, it is uh, difficult to embolize these uh, tumors effectively, uh, preoperatively. So we are usually not performing angiography. And you can also see that uh, they are closely related, related to the um, anterior cerebral artery, um, which is in, especially in large tumors, uh, displaced and closely related to the posterior and superior aspect of the tumor. Of course, other structures which are important, uh, particularly for the approach, are the um, sinuses, which is especially the frontal sinus, uh, the etmoidal sinus, and the cribriform area, which is a very weak area, or the weakest area actually in the uh, skull base. Um, and these are the sites where CSF leaks can occur, and you have to address these um, potential complications and uh, cover it effectively. And you have to deal with anatomic variations, uh, which um, may be um, a very aerated uh, frontal sinus uh, or a very thick bone. Both of these patients had uh, anterior um, um, 
cranial fossa meningiomas, and you have to deal with these uh, anatomic variants. Uh, so we have to analyze the neuroimaging very carefully before uh, performing or before deciding a surgery. What are the approaches described in these uh, tumors? Um, the one which is uh, which I already mentioned, frontolateral, and its um, keyhole uh, variant, the supraorbital keyhole approach. Um, you have the bifrontal, subfrontal um, uh, approach with or without, without orbital osteotomy, and a more posterolateral approach, uh, the pteronal approach, the traditional pteronal approach. Other approaches are the bifrontal interhemispheric approach without opening the frontal sinus. Uh, and you've got, of course, the uh, endoscopic um, endonasal approaches for these uh, tumors in the anterior cranial fossa. Uh, my personal preference in these uh, tumors are usually the anterior midline approaches, usually the bifrontal subfrontal approach. Uh, less common, the bifrontal interhemispheric approach. And for the more posterior located uh, tumors uh, or the, uh, the ones on the planum sphenoidal or tuberculum cellae, uh, I'm using, uh, using the uh, traditional tyronal approach. What are the reasons for uh, this approach preference? Um, usually these tumors are midline and they are usually bilateral. When diagnosed, they are often um, large or, or even giant, um, defined by, by um, diameter larger than six centimeters. And you often find uh, that um, uh, the um, tumors are have an on plaque growth, on plaque growth, or have um, islands which are uh, apart from the main tumor bone. So you have got um, this, these approaches uh, give you the, the best opportunity to um, view, overview the frontal base, to address the hyperstosis, to address also the vascularization coming from the anterior skull base in these uh, tumors early in the phase uh, of surgery. Um, and uh, you have a good opportunity to uh, preserve the olfactory nerves. Um, if olfaction is, in, is, is uh, still present uh, preoperatively, and you can um, open the op preserve and open the um, optic canals um, uh, with the optic nerves in case uh, there is an um, extension of these tumors into the optic canals. Um, a topic which is uh, not very often addressed in the literature is uh, that the depth of the olfactory, the, the depth of the cribriform fossa, the olfactory groove, um, vary uh, greatly uh, in patients, and it may be up to 60 millimeters in the anterior part of the cribriform plate, and up to 10 millimeters in the posterior part. So it is. Um, might be difficult to, to um, uh, dip into this uh, or these very deep cribriform plates uh, from a lateral, any lateral uh, approach, including the frontal lateral or the posterior lateral approach. Uh, so these uh, actually, these are best addressed from the anterior approach. Um, in our publication in 2007, we also uh, stress that uh, often these tumors are entering the um, optic canals. And so um, you have to um, look for tumor um, remnants uh, in the optic canals and remove them in order to prevent any uh, late um, um, tumor recurrence. Also, these approaches give you um, a large vascularized uh, pericranial flap. Uh, which you can use for sealing the frontal sinus uh, if it is opened, uh, or the uh, skull base, the complete anterior skull base, um, if it was opened, uh, for example, during drilling. There are drawbacks in these um, approaches, uh, one of which is uh, that uh, if you are using a transfrontal sinus um, approach, uh, you have to uh, remove the mucosa, very carefully in order to avoid a mucosal, a light mucosal, which might, might be a complication. And um, there is late observation of important structures like the optic nerves and the anterior uh, cerebral arteries. Um, so um, in large tumors, when the surgeon is already 
tired. Uh, these important structures are coming very late and you have to be very patient to, to dissect these uh, structures carefully. Now some uh, examples um, showing different aspects, um, different approaches and also different aspects in, in these surgeries. Um, this is a 50 year old patient who had a large um, uh, frontal skull base meningioma. Um, actually it was a giant um, um, hollow anterior uh, cranial fossa meningioma and she presented with um, almost complete blindness on the right side. You can see here the um, CT scan showing calcification um, in this uh, tumor, meaning also that this is of um, hard consistency. And you can see also uh, the hyperstosis, the basal hyperstosis of this uh, tumor. Um, in the uh, MRI, you can see the hyperstosis. Um, and when with a closer look, you can see um, contrast enhancement in this uh, hyperostosis, and this means that these are vital tumor cells which have to be removed in order to prevent any uh, late recurrence. This is very important. Uh, and also, you have uh, you can see that the tumor is encroaching into the optic canals. So these uh, have to be addressed. In this patient, uh, it was more on the right side on the blind uh, eye. So this is um, part of the surgery showing you the uh, left good optic nerve. Uh, this was only compressed by the tumor. You have to dissect it very carefully or the tumor from the optic nerve. The hyperostosis, which has to be addressed, I usually drill it with the, uh, with the uh, diamond drill, six millimeters, four millimeters. Uh, and this has to be done very carefully in order to prevent the recurrence and also to uh, deprive the tumor from the, its vascularization. This is the right optic nerve, which is much more involved by the tumor, showing that this is compressed. There's still an, an arachnoid dissection membrane, which is very important to preserve the function. But you can see that the vascularization is a verification of the vascularization also an indentation of the optic nerve from the tumor at uh, this part. So this is, these are the vessels of the anterior uh, cerebral artery, which have to be dissected very carefully from the tumor. And uh, often large tumors are getting part of their uh, vascularization also from the pier, from tricks from the anterior communicating in uh, anterior cerebral arteries. And sometimes these vessels are also engulfed in the tumor, so they have to be very carefully separated to prevent uh, any infarctions. This is uh, after removing the main bulk of the tumor, you see both optic nerves, the chiasm and the lamina terminalis, and the anterior uh, cerebral arteries, and uh, tumor remnant, which is here. And after removing this tumor remnant, for can also see the pituitary stalk, which is usually uh, preserved and uh, which is usually protected by arachnoid membranes. This is opening of the uh, optic canal. So we know from the preoperative MRI that is, there's tumor in, and this you can see here. This is a tumor. This has to be removed in order to get a complete tumor resection and prevent any late recurrence in a strategically uh, yeah, very important area. So this is the MRI after uh, surgery, after removal of the um, tumor. And this is uh, the CT scan showing a complete removal of the hyperostosis. And this is the patient six months after surgery. Um, and fortunately in this uh, patient, uh, the vision, uh, um, became almost normal uh, on the right side. Um, you can see the um, vision uh, preoperatively. This is uh, two months after surgery. And uh, this is uh, six months after surgery. She almost got um, normal vision uh, on the right side. This is the left eye also became better. This is preoperatively. And this is uh, postoperatively, as you can see. 
This is another case also interesting, giving also some uh, interesting aspects. This is a 65 year old woman. She had very yeah, unspecific uh, symptoms, weight gain, muscle twitching in the face, neck and right arm. More specifically, she had a right-sided anosmia and a left hyposmia. Otherwise, she was um, um, neurologically intact. And uh, you can see this uh, tumor, which is not large. Uh, and in the uh, coronal uh, uh, view, you can see that it is midline. So it is um, actually can be also removed uh, endoscopically. This is, uh, I think, um, uh, yeah everybody would say, okay, this is a good case for endoscopy. Uh, I'm showing you also this posterior aspect. Uh, you can see that the tumor is restricted to the midline, almost uh, symmetrically on both sides. And there's no hint that there any uh, tumor uh, beside the main bulk of the tumor. Um, in this case, also, there are very deep um, olfactory grooves, as you can see here. And when it's uh, looking at the uh, T2 weighted MRI coronal sections, you can see that uh, the right side, the anosmic side, is invaded by tumor, while you can identify the olfactory nerve on the left side. So it should be preserved. And this would be uh, something which you cannot achieve with um, underneath endoscopy or trans uh, endonasal uh, endoscopy. So this is the positioning. I removed this tumor via frontal interhemispheric approach, not opening the, the frontal sinus. And um, of course, in you um, are transecting the um, most anterior part of the superior sagittal sinus and the, the falx in order to have a real midline symmetrical approach. And um, you, of course, in this approach, you are uh, reaching the base of the tumor late, so you can address uh, only late the, um, the uh, vascularization. You can see here the left um, olfactory nerve, which is only compressed um, in the more posterior part by the tumor, uh, but it can be preserved. And this is the right side, uh, where the um, olfactory nerve is, com is infiltrated by the tumor and you cannot uh, preserve it um, if you want to achieve a complete tumor re um, resection. This is the uh, olfactory groove um, or cribriform uh, uh, fossa on the right side. These are the vessels attached to the tumor. Also, you have to um, um, dissect them very carefully in order to prevent any ischemia. And this is an interesting uh, point. This is the optic nerve, right? right? And these are two more uh, parts which you could not see on the MRI. So these surely would have been missed by, and these are on the lateral side of the optic nerves, and surely would have been missed by any, any endoscopic. So, um, uh, and this is um, uh, not um, an exception, it's rather um, a rule. And you can see here, the frontal base has to be cleaned, uh, uh, the dura, um, and the olfactory groove on the right side um, uh, is covered by the uh, and then a vascularized um, perocranial flap. So this is the approach. It is um, without opening of the frontal sinus, uh, the 3D reconstruction in uh, post-operative uh, CT scan. And uh, this is the MRI showing complete tumor removal. And this is the patient. Um, um, good um, uh, cosmetic result. You cannot see anything. Um, and also very important that the olfaction was preserved. I couldn't explain why there was also cessation of the muscle twitching, uh, I don't know, the, I cannot explain the pathophysiology of this, uh, of this deficit or of this uh, symptom. Uh, this is another patient. Uh, she had uh, two tumors. Uh, one was a sphenoid wing meningioma uh, and the other was an olfactory groove meningioma and uh, 
both tumors grew in a one year period. And uh, we discussed with the patient um, about follow up or removing. Of course, there was a preference in this young patient to remove both tumors because there was um, uh, growth progression and uh, she decided for, to, for, um, for surgery. And this is the um, small effector groove uh, meningioma. You can see here also uh, progressing um, uh, in this uh, one year period. Uh, this is the um, surgery. It is from a uh, left tyrannal approach. And I'm only showing the part um, of the uh, olfactory nerve. So this is underneath the, or the frontal lobe and the olfactory nerve, which you can see here. And you can see also there's some difficulty to get into or underneath um, uh, the, uh, the olfactory groove um, from this lateralized approach, uh, but uh, it succeeded. So um, the tumor could be completely removed. Both tumors could be completely removed in this post-operative uh, MRI. Uh, and what is uh, was interesting in this patient um, is that uh, actually I, uh, the, the olfactory groove meningioma was just, um, yeah, uh, was uh, the, the side topic. The main was the, the uh, sphenoid wing meningioma, but she said spontaneously on follow-up, uh, is it possible that also my olfaction and my taste became better after surgery? So uh, this is one of the cases where probably there, due to compression of the olfactory nerve, uh, there was um, um, a deficit also in olfaction, which was in, uh, ameliorated after decompression. This is another patient, and this uh, case shows you that you have to be flexible in, in, in uh, uh, your approaches. You have not to be fixed um, with one approach. This is a very large uh, tumor, a giant anterior skull base tumor with extensive um, uh, skull, skull base involvement. And this patient also had a pituitary insufficiency, which can be explained why with this posterior tumor part digging into the um, um, cellar. You can see also the lateral um, extension of the tumor. Actually, it looks like two tumors or pissing tumors because the contrast enhancement is a bit difficult, but could not differentiate in them intraoperatively. And in this uh, patient, I performed by uh, subfrontal, interhemispheric, and also pteronal approach. So. Um, as a message, you should always tailor um, your approaches uh, to the um, um, pathology uh, which you are addressing. Uh, so this is the post-operative uh, MRI after complete uh, removal. And this is the patient six days after uh, removal of the tumor. Um, of course, mental function uh, required some time, but uh, it became much better and almost uh, normal after um, some months another patient, a 72-year-old um, man who presented with a syncope um, and an MRI was performed. So this um, is an incidental finding, uh, but on uh, clinical examination, he had a right uh, hyposmia. Um, so um, we discussed with the patient and he decided for removing this, uh, which is not a very small tumor. It is a medium uh, tumor and he decided for uh, resecting this tumor. And in this uh, patient, I performed a right supraorbital mini craniotomy. I'm using um, an incision in the eyebrow. There are other variants, um, as you know, which might be above the eyebrow a bit or transpalpebral. Um, but I think cosmetically, the um, incision in the eyebrow is um, maybe superior. Uh, you are performing a burr hole under the uh, lateral orbital uh, uh, pillar, this area, after, of course, removing the um, anterior part of the temporal muscle. In this patient, uh, the dura was also opened um, during uh, burr.
aura hole and, um, and craniotomy because of um, adhesion of the dura to the bone. And you have to check for the frontal sinus uh, specifically if it was open during your approach and you have to flatten the anterior uh, skull base in order to have a good view on the tumor, an unobstructed view. Um, so the uh, cryotomy should be flush with the anterior cranial fossa. And of course, you can, in this approach, um, deprive the tumor from its vascularization. And this is, uh, this is very important. These are the arachnoid membranes, which have to be preserved and which are actually facilitating your dissection, um, especially from the optic nerves, the pituitary stalk, uh, and the anterior um, cerebral arteries. So the tumor was um, first um, compressed and then removed. And uh, this, is, uh, this is also an example that there were tumor islands apart from the main tumor bulk, which have to be addressed. Um, in this patient, uh, I did not open the optic um, canal uh, because it, uh, I did not find any tumor here. You could open it, of course. Um, but uh, there were tumor islands um, on the optic canal. And this is an endoscopic view of removing uh, the tumor. And you can see here the right um, optic nerve and the left optic nerve. You can also uh, see into the um, optic canals if there are any tumor remnants. And you put a very nice uh, view and uh, for, for checking the surgical side. This is the olfactory nerve preserved. And of course, the, you have to um, reconstruct the dural defect. And this is the bone flap, which is around two and a half uh, by one and a half centimeters, uh, which is uh, replaced. This is um, after skin incision, after skin um, closing. So this is the MRI pre and post operatively. Um, olfaction was uh, preserved in this patient. Um, uh, and this is uh, the 3D reconstruction. Uh, and this is the um, patient. Um, uh, I think also it is a uh, good um, cosmetic result. And uh, interestingly, this was a grade two, an atypical manager. So I think it was a good decision to remove it. Uh, how about skull base surgery in the elderly patient, uh, 80 and above? Uh, this is, I show you two examples. This is a patient who uh, presented, or woman who presented with an epileptic fit, 80 years old, and some mental disturbance. And this is uh, preoperatively and postoperative, uh, preoperatively and postoperative, pre and postoperative, also addressing, of course, the um, the hyperostosis on the frontal base was removed. And this is the patient um, to regain full life quality and had no postoperative deficits or nor any epileptic fits after surgery. This is another example, a 82 year old patient who actually was suspected to have a stroke because he had decreased consciousness and on performing an MRI, this uh, large meningioma uh, was seen with a, also a large bilateral uh, edema, and this is preoperative and postoperative. Usually, the edema um, decreases um, to a great degree after surgery, and this is uh, pre and postoperative uh, in this patient, pre and postoperative MRI, and uh, he also had a, a known uh, torticollis since uh, 30 years. So this was, of course, unchanged, but he regained full life quality and had no uh, deficits. So, so you can um, perform this um, uh, surgery also on elderly patients. Uh, about complications, I'm showing you uh, one. Um, generally spoken, complications can be avoided. And this was a 65-year-old woman. She had mental slowing over uh, several months. And this um, uh, meningioma, which has a, a, a bit curious uh, uh, configuration. And you can see there's a large uh, bifrontal edema explaining this mental slowing over months. 
Uh, and this is the surgery showing the complication. There's a tumor part and I was pulling on this uh, tumor part and then had an arterial rupture. Uh, so of course, uh, this was surgeon's fault, more, more uh, defined my fault. Um, and it took me um, a long time to, to, to solve this problem. So uh, the, the main surgery was on solving this complication and finally, I got uh, this uh, bleeding stop with a clip uh, and preserving these uh, vessels. And uh, I was afraid that there might be postoperative um, uh, frontal lobe swelling. So I left the, um, the um, uh, bone flap outside. Um, and this was replaced two months after surgery. Um, and this is the um, resection of the tumor. Um, uh, six months after surgery, showing complete resection. Um, and also the edema um, has uh, much decreased uh, after surgery, which is usually the case uh, in this patient. This is the patient six months after surgery. Fortunately, she had made a full recovery and had no uh, neurological deficits. So um, as a summary and uh, take home message, um, I divided into the following headings, head, headings. Uh, first the approach, the function, uh, recurrence prevention and complication avoidance. So um, in regard to approach, I generally, not only in this uh, topic under discussion, but generally I prefer choose simple approaches, but they have to be individualized. and. Uh, um, in my experience, these uh, tumors can be completely removed by standard neurosurgical approaches. Uh, you do not need any orbiter to me. It is important to have the craniotomy if you're using anterior approaches uh, flush with the anterior skull base. Uh, so we do not need any retraction. In all the cases I've shown, uh, there were no uh, fixed retractions uh, needed. You have to individualize the approach as also I've shown you in some examples. You have to consider tumor uh, parameters like the extent uh, of the tumor, like um, the hyperostosis, uh, clinical factors um, like is there uh, olfaction which should be preserved, um, anatomical factors like the depth of the fibroform plate, extent of the frontal sinus uh, and thickness of the bone, which I've uh, shown you. You have to take these into consideration and adapt your um, um, approach accordingly. What about uh, function? Um, you have um, mainly three topics, which is olfaction, vision, and mental in these uh, patients. Uh, so if there's any olfaction present, Preoperative, you should try to preserve it. Um, and you should look um, for an intact olfactory nerve uh, preoperatively in your MRI images and also intraoperatively because this contributes much to, um, to the life quality of the patient after surgery. And uh, as I've shown you, you have to respect the arachnoid plane towards the frontal lobes, the optic nerves, um, all the um, nervous um, structures and the vascular structures. Um, at sites where there's an abs where there's a brain edema, there may be, it might be an, an absence of arachnoid membrane and the, the tumor might be even invading uh, the, um, the brain at these sites. So should be very careful to preserve the brain tissue. Um, about recurrence, I've stressed this uh, point. Um, you can prevent uh, recurrence in these uh, tumors. Uh, you have to notice that, that uh, these tumors are usually have an on plaque growth, even if it's not, not visible, visible in, in, on preoperative MRI. You can find on plaque uh, parts of the tumor, you find remote uh, tumor islands. Um, and you very often uh, find an encroachment and entering of the tumor into the optic canals. And in, in my view, these are the rule. Uh, this is the rule rather than the exception. And you have to uh, look for this. And um, as a result, an overview 
approach, overviewing the anterior skull base, in my view, is much more favorable than an underview, an endoscopic underview for complete resection and particularly for uh, late uh, recurrence prevention. Uh, and you have, as I said, you have to carefully look into the optic uh, canals, removing any tumor here, and you have to address the uh, hyperostosis, which is usually present and which should, you, should be removed, uh, because this uh, surely will be a um, source of late recurrence. Um, you ha might have soft tumors, which are easier to remove, actually, but um, often in these tumors, there, there is a tumor rim which is attached to the underneath the frontal lobe, so, so you have to remove this carefully. And in these cases, also endoscopic control might be helpful to, to, to detect these tumor remnants. Uh, you have tumors with a firm consistency, which are usually um, yeah, more completely removed, but there may be more adherence to the vessels and uh, to the nervous uh, structures in these uh, tumors. So you have to be uh, careful to protect these, uh, um, these uh, structures. What about complications? Generally, um, I would say that all complications can be avoided. So any complication, or in other words, any complications happening, uh, uh, you have to be honest with yourself. It's the um, surgeon's fault, and you have to uh, analyze it very carefully to avoid it the next time. So um, at some points, you have to respect the arachnoid dissection planes. This is very important. You have to treat, especially in these tumors, any potential CSF leak site, uh, like an olfactory groove or the etmoidal um, um, air sinuses, um, and uh, a vascularized peroceal uh, flap is the best natural uh, sealing material, and um, all industrial materials are not uh, um, much uh, lower in, in efficiency and quality. And as I've, I've shown you, you should not pull on any tumor parts in, uh, in order to avoid any vascular tear, uh, particularly in the superior and posterior tumor circumference. So I came to the end. Thank you very much again uh, for your kind invitation and um, yeah, for having me with you. And I'm uh, glad to take any questions. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bassoni, for a very practical uh, description of your experience with uh, anterior skull base meningiomas. Uh, you know, I do these meningiomas. I had also delivered the same uh, a lecture on the same topic about a month ago, where you know my pre personal preference is for uh, trans, uh, uh, you know, the, the tyrional approach with the trans, you know, opening the arachnoid at the optic carotid cistern getting the CSF release so that the frontal lobe eases and uh, reduces the retraction. My criticism against the bifrontal approach is that you have to encounter the frontal sinus, you have to ligate and divide the uh, superior sagittal sinus, and most importantly, you're seeing the vascular structures, especially the anterior artery towards the end. So when you come from the side, you get to see the A1, and then you can chase it up to the A2 as you become a skewma both of which are blind when you go from a midline approach. Uh, what are your thoughts on this one? Yeah, I, the, I, I put them as drawbacks from the, um, uh, from the anterior, um, uh, anterior approaches, uh, what you have said. Um, the, um, yeah, the, the, the pterinal approach for these uh, tumors, um, as far as I know, have been described in, in 89 by Hasler and Sentner. Um, and they're good approaches. Uh, the point is um, that in these tumors, we're talking, we're talking about anterior uh, tumors, um, which are almost abutting on the frontal bone, uh, often in these cases. Um, it is, um, you have a long way from the pterinal um, uh, side to reach a bilateral uh, tumor. And the problem in all the lateralized uh, approaches is uh, um, how uh, do you reach um, the, a deep uh, cribriform uh, yeah, valley, I, I would call it. Yes. Um, and this is, uh, this is a drawback. And you can, you can, of course, use the endoscope uh, to see the tumor. 
but practically spoken, it is more difficult to uh, remove this uh, tumor. Um, uh, uh, you can see it, uh, but it is more difficult, if, especially if you want to protect also the olfactory nerve, it is more difficult to, to remove it. Um, so you are right, you are addressing very important structures very early. You will get uh, CSF press um, um, or um, uh, good space from this um, more posterior approach. I, um, I'm using this approach in the more posterior located uh, tumors and where my frontal approach gives me a longer distance to the tumor. Uh, so, but in, in um, many of the cases, you, you see that the tumor are almost abutting, are they are they're lying in front of you and, and you've got um, uh, even, you got directly, you, you're getting directly on the tumor when removing it. To, or attacking it from, from the frontal side. But uh, there, of course, uh, all the approaches have got good sides and, and drawbacks. That's, uh, that's the problem. And, you, and that's the, the point uh, I was stressing. You have to individualize these uh, approaches. What is the best for the patient? Yeah, uh, we have a question from one of the attendees here. Dr. Harshad Parikh wants to know, what is the fate of all faction? Does it recover after surgery? I think you have also already answered the question with your experience, but this yeah, is... olfaction. Uh, I've got. Uh, I showed you one patient, and there are other patients, but actually these are rare. Where olfaction even might become better, um, but this is the exception. I would say um, uh, the point or the the uh, goal in these surgeries is that you want to preserve the. Uh, olfaction which is present um, and if uh, often these tumors are uh, at least to the to the skull base they may be asymmetric so they are um, involving one olfactory nerve which has to be taken in order to remove the complete tumor and i've shown you this um, case with the interhemispheric approach uh, and you can preserve the other um, olfactory all, all nerve, and um, then you can pre preserve um, or yeah, the, the olfactory which was present um, preoperative. So this is actually the goal um, with olfactory, and th this should be um, examined preoperatively. That's very important. If there is any olfactory, you have to make a differential um, uh, examination, uh, examining the right and the left side um, uh, uh, separately from from each. Okay, one more question that I have in mind is, do you employ radiotherapy for your grade two tumors or you wait and watch? Upfront radiotherapy versus wait and watch? What is your personal this, take on this? Um, okay. Um, when we are discussing these cases in the tumor board, I always uh, have a dispute with my um, radiotherapist on this topic. Of course, says atypical uh, tumors or grade two tumors, you should irradiate. My personal view is that if you have the um, the impression in surgery that you could have or that you achieved the complete removal of the tumor, uh, and you also can show this on the post-operative MRI, I would um, wait. I would not use um, radiation in these tumors. And I would uh, yeah, wait and control uh, these tumors. That's my personal preference. I would um, avoid uh, irradiation because you're always radiation is not uh, harmless. It is uh, harmful, and I would personally avoid irradiation in grade ones, grade twos, and grade three is another topic you have to use it. But um, in grade ones and two, I, I usually avoid it. Thank you very much, sir. Right. Over to you, Dr. Raja. Thank you very much. This was a wonderful discussion and obviously a very good lecture. We can invite comments as well as questions from the audiences. Yes, Professor Takashi Kohn from Tokyo has joined us. Any questions from you? Uh, thank you. Uh, it was a, a very beautiful uh, presentation. Uh, as for frontal skull based tumor, so I have few experience about it and uh, are very fearful of CSF leakage. And uh, uh, or, uh, and as for olfactory group meningioma, so postoperative edema 
or residual tumor and uh, olfactory and nerve damage is also a problem. So are there any to avoid the CSF leakage? So do you use a drainage, spinal drainage uh, before or you don't, you don't have to use, you don't use uh, spinal drainage uh, before surgery? Uh, I'm um, generally a skull base uh, surgery. I'm not using a spinal drainage for surgery. Okay. I um, in in olfactory groove meningiomas, especially in the in the frontal approaches, uh, of course you have not a direct uh, egress uh, to the uh, to the cisterns. That's true, okay. uh, but uh, you have tumor, and uh, of course the tumor gives you the way. Uh, you are decompressing the tumor and working from anterior to posterior and then finally it, uh, reach the, the um, and in the tumor, um, when you debulk it, it gives you the space. Mm. And um, in patients, even in the, in the ones with a very huge, and uh, I've shown you the cases, uh, um, bifrontal edema, it mm. is not the, it is, it is other than traumatic cases. This is, this is not a ah. cytotoxic edema where you've got uh, opening and you've got a swelling. Uh, and closing of your space. No, this is an, uh, another type of edema. It is a structural edema. And uh, it is not that the frontal lobes are, you're, you're getting some space and it, the, the lobes are closing the space. No, you've got the space. Uh, and I think that um, it is only closing your space if you are rough to the frontal lobes. Mm. But if you are leaving the frontal lobes alone and do not, uh, yeah, you not. I'm not using retractors in any of these surgeries, and just attacking the tumor, and you're leaving the, the frontal lobes, then um, then it is there will be no swelling, and uh, you can see this also on follow up. Uh, if you remove the tumor, even after years, you see that also in patients with with a large um, bifrontal edema, you will all always see a, a, a small site where. Uh, there was a, the tumor, so it is not closing the, the tumor space. In regard to, um, uh, to CSF leak, um, I generally say that um, I think that uh, this is an avoidable complication. And I think, uh, and this is something which is pro the anterior approaches, um, you can harvest a large vascularized flap. Um, and uh, there's no no better material. All the, mm -hmm. the astral material is, is mm -hmm. less uh, in quality than, than this beautiful uh, periosteal flap where it can cover. Mm -hmm. but, and I'm usually, I'm using multi-layer. I'm not using right. only the, the periosteal flap. I'm using uh, tachoseal uh, and a multi-layer um, so to, to ensure this cover. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Thank maybe you. Thank maybe you. one one important point also is mm -hmm. that um, I'm not um, um, yeah generally opening opening all the, the cisterns. Uh, you have to also be careful with opening the cisterns uh, mm -hmm. because if you the more you open, the more will be CSF flow. Uh, if you are opening just a few cisterns which are necessary to have um, CSF egress. Um, and then you have a small also opening uh, which you can cover. This is much better, and this I think will also reduce your um, your CSF leak complications. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. Finished. Yes, my co-host Dr. Liu Bun Seng. Thanks, uh, Raja. Thanks, Professor, for a very nice uh, uh, presentation. I have one question for you, Professor. In a large uh, meningioma, big like meningioma with unilateral anosmia, uh, would you decompress the tumor uh, from the uh, anosmia site before you go to the uh, normal uh, smell site? And, and do you try to identify the nerve early or decompress the tumor first? And also, at the same time, would you admit the same patient uh, earlier for dexamethasone uh, 48 hours before surgery and do you prescribe anti-seizure medication since you do not retract the frontal rope? Thank you, Professor. Um, so I'm getting the, the last question for first. Um, uh, about dexamethasone, um, I'm usually, when I see a, um, a large edema, I'm usually pre-treating these patients with uh, dexamethasone, yes. Um, but um, 
it is only for a short time. It's not uh, not for four weeks. It's just uh, for some days uh, before surgery and then fading uh, fading after surgery. You don't you don't need it after surgery actually. Um, about the um, approach, um, if I have a unilateral um, tumor. Uh, then of course I try to attack it primarily from the from the side of the tumor, which is usually the also the anosmic side. Um, but actually, when I'm using a bilateral um, or symmetric uh, anterior approach, um, it is not. Um, it, 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 I'm I'm attacking the tumor uh, at the side where it is most or the closest to me, which is. Uh, which does not depend which side is your anosmic or or not. But of course, I I've, have in mind the olfactory nerve, which I want to preserve. Um, I, I, I think you had a third question. Um, An anti seizure medication, professor. Anti seizure medication. Anti, anti seizure. I'm not using. I'm not using. Um, usually, these patients they have one seizure if if they present with a seizure. Is not the rule. It's actually I had one patient in this um, um, in the examples I've shown you who had a seizure, um, but I'm not using any seizure medication. Or, uh, also, also not using any uh, prophylactic anti seizure medication. And um, I would say that um, you you hardly see any. If you are that's very important if you are perform your surgery very carefully with protecting the brain uh, tissue, then uh, you you will not see any seizure post-operative uh, usually. Thank, Thank you very much. much. There's one question on the chat box. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Dr. Farmanga Nagubri. Uh, thank you, Professor Pasioni, for a well-tailored talk. I would like to get insight into the following. Your experience with loss of smell without damage to the olfaction nerve. And two, surgical indication for anterior based tumors based on tumor size. Your experience with loss of smell without damage to the olfactory nerve. Yeah. Um, if, in, in, regard, in regard to olfactory, of course, um, it is not only you have not only to preserve the nerve tissue, but you have to preserve also the uh, vascularization of the. Um, uh, olfactory nerve. So, uh, so even if you preserve the um, the um, olfactory nerve, uh, but you damage the vascularization, you can have a loss of smell, and of course the um, the fila olfactoria. They are very delicate, and you are, if you are, and that's uh, one of the reasons I do not use retractors. I just use the the, the space what is given by the tumor. Uh, if you are using retraction, then uh, you might uh, tear these filo olfactoria. Um, and uh, of course, then you will get lots of ol olfaction. So you have to be very, very careful. And the olfactory nerve is a very um, delicate structure. And uh, it is very also very um, delicate to any tearing. And it, uh, uh, it can, yeah. It, and lose continuity uh, alone from 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 tearing. So this is very important. Um, there was another part of the question, I think. Uh, you know, the side of approach or the approach based on the size of the tumor. Does it influence your side? This thing approach is influenced by the size of the tumor. Um, of course, as I've said, that uh, you have to choose, uh, or you you have to be variable with the approaches. I've shown you uh, this very large tumor, which was lateralized. So I used a lateralized approach, also a, a peroneal component of the approach, um, to um, also to get this tumor out safely. Um, if you are using the anterior midline approaches, you have a good overview on both sides, so it does not uh, matter um, how where the tumor is um, uh, lateralized. Of course, in the, the more specific, the supraorbital, of course, you, you, as I've shown, you you use the side of the tumor. Um, although you have also an overview on the other side, um, and of course, in the uh, frontal. Uh, frontolateral or peroneal approach um, also the uh, I would approach the tumor from the, the major tumor 
portion side. Right. Thank you very much. We had a beautiful discussion, and right now it's time to wind up. We can hear the concluding remarks from Professor Ishwar himself. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hisham Basioni, for a wonderful journey of your personal experience for anterior skull base meningiomas. You have had a comprehensive uh, uh, cover for all type of uh, you know all type of meningiomas. You have had a, you have covered the bifrontal approach. You have covered the periodontal approach. You have also done the suprabro mini craniotomy approach, which was actually popularized by Dr. Axel Bernersky uh, some uh, 40, 30, 40 years ago, which has stood the test of time. Uh, thank you very much for taking us through your personal journey, which is a great educational experience for all of us. Thank you again and have a good night. If that is night there at part of your part of the world. It's, it's not night yet. <laughs> it's afternoon uh, <laughs> still. And uh, thank you very much uh, for your in kind invitation. And it was a real great pleasure to, to join you in this webinar series, which uh, I think is very su successful. And uh, uh, these are, well, a bit the positive sides of the COVID uh, pandemia. It's a spread of webinars and uh, if there are positive sides, but this is one. Yeah, we don't have to come to Germany to listen to you. We can do that. You, you, are, you are cordially invited uh, anytime, of course. Thank well, you. thank you. Thank, thank you very you. much. That was indeed a wonderful discussion that followed a very beautiful lecture. Now it's time to wind up officially. On behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President, Professor Yoko Kaita, I would like to thank both the speakers of today, Professor Hyun Singh Kim and Professor Hisham Basioni, as well as the chairs, Professor Malcolm Pestonji and Professor Ishwar Ashvi for the time and support for the ACNS webinars. And my sincere thanks to Professor Shubin for the broadcasting this on the WeChat channel. And as I said earlier, there are around 450 people who watched this live on different streaming platforms. Special thanks to my co-host Liu Bun Singh for joining in today. So until we all meet on the 6th of August, it is bye-bye from all of us. Thank you very much for joining.